Hey everybody, um, this is video number four in the five areas of jazz study series. Today we're going to be talking about the jazz language. So there is some controversy about the jazz language. Uh, I actually read an article recently saying that there is no jazz language. The guy was saying, he, he made a list of musical aspects and he pointed out that each one of those musical aspects is shared by other styles of music. So therefore there's no jazz language. It's just music. And I completely disagree. Now, I don't know how deeply the controversy goes. I hear people talking about language, but I never hear them talking about it in the way that I talk about it. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this video. Uh, you know, my history with the language, it's not something that I was taught. The people who taught me, I didn't take a lot of jazz classes, okay? So I did go to, to workshops and guest you know when we're whenever we had guest performers or whatever i would hear what they had to say um but most of the teaching that i've heard before was really the play this scale over that chord and i think that's i don't mean any offense to my past teachers but that's not a good way to teach jazz in fact i would go as far as to say it's a bad way to teach jazz improvisation there's no there's not much that can come out of that that's very good. That's my, my experience. That's what I believe. Anyway, so one education that I did get, and you probably never heard of him, there was a trumpet player when I lived in El Paso. His name was Gerald Hunter. He was a blind man, and I used to go to his, his performances and I would just soak up everything he was doing. And what I loved to do is get close enough to watch his fingers on the valves. And, you know, knowing he was blind and knowing that he didn't go to college or anything like that for music. I don't know if he ever went to college, but I know he wasn't college trained in music. Um, he played in the style of Roy Eldridge. I would think that's the closest as far as trumpet players that I've heard. He played more like Roy Eldridge than anybody else that I've ever heard live. And, but to watch him when he was playing, I would wa mostly watch his fingers and, and I could hear what key they were in. And I would watch and I would notice certain patterns starting. And he would, if it was in that key, I would see that same pattern in other tunes that were in that key. And it got me thinking about the way he played in contrast to the way I was being taught by the clinicians and stuff like that. And it didn't line up. It didn't match. And the way I describe this now has changed from what it was back then. I used to call them uh, idioms. And that made sense. That, I think that still works today, but there's language already that we can use to describe what I'm talking about. So I, I changed it from idioms to language because that's, people were actually saying that already. Um, but yes, it was Gerald Hunter that pointed me in this direction. Watching him play in that, that little bit more dated style. Even back then, people were complaining that his playing was dated. Um, but it was good for me to see that because I could see the motifs with my eyes and hear them. I think I th it was one of the best jazz educations I ever get, ever, uh, that I ever had. So, obviously, I disagree with this guy that there is no jazz language. And what I like to do with my students, and I'm going to do it with you here now, is I'm going to explain it, starting with this old saying, people often say that you, your solo, your improvised solo, should tell a story. Think about that. If you haven't been told that already, then you're 
consider yourself told now, all right? Your solo should tell a story. What that means is it's not just random notes and phrases and stuff that you put together. There should be a coherent shape to your solo. It should, when you're finished, your solo should have meant something. Okay? Now, we're going to use that as a basis for exploring what is the language. So look over here. We have on one side, we have the story. On this side, we have the language. I mean, the, the jazz stuff, right? The story and then the jazz solo. Next thing down, we have, we can break the story into paragraphs, right? So what's the equivalent in the jazz improv in your solo to paragraphs? I would say that choruses would be the equivalent of a paragraph. And then let's go down one more. Sentences in jazz, a sentence would be your phrase. You can have short phrases, you can have long phrases, just like a sentence. Then we're going to skip the next one because that's, that's the main one. Let's go down to the bottom now and look at what is the equivalent of syllables. That would be notes. Now, look at this. Somewhere between sentences and notes, there's another unit. In the written language, in, in spoken English, it would be a word. What is the equivalent of the word in the jazz solo? Think about it before I tell you the answer. If you can't think of the answer, then you have not been taught right. In my opinion, you're missing the most important part of learning how to play jazz. Have you figured it out yet? It's called a motif. And most jazz players have anywhere between 20% of their whole solo to 80% of their solo, sometimes 90% of their solo is going to be motivic content. And what's left over is usually filler stuff like uh, a glissando or something like that. But in all of the great jazz players, there is motivic content, and it's that motivic content that separates out one style from the, from the next. You know, I can, I can improvise classical, right? Okay, that's sort of a like Mozart kind of thing, right? Um, how about a Viennese waltz? And I'm making this stuff up all, all off the top of my head. Okay. Um, how about a a uh, march. All right, doesn't that sound like a march? Let's try blues. Did that sound like the blues? This isn't my best improvisation that I've done before, but you can hear the style of what I'm talking about. How about something like this? Does that sound sort of like bar talk? The motifs that we use when we're improvising sort of define the style, not sort of, they define the style of what we're doing. You know, we talk sometimes about note choice, and I think that's a little shallow. 
it's not note choice that matters, it's motif choice. And so we can talk about note choice. No, most people talk about note choice in the, in the context of over the top of the chord. Okay? Motif choice. The motif is what this defines the style. So if I'm playing, those that was a spontaneous improvisation but i used jazz motifs and it would have been clearly recognizable as something that was in the style of let's say 1940s 50s jazz and that's the foundation those motifs are the foundation of all the jazz that comes after that we depart from that when we get more modern and, and get more into the, the more experimental stuff, but the foundation of that should always remain. Otherwise, you, it's hard to actually pinpoint um, the style. Now, artistically, we have the freedom to do that. But I'm not really talking artistically, am I? I'm talking educationally. You, you know, it's okay to say, that you can't define jazz. I understand that. It's not okay to say, therefore, just do whatever you want to do, it's jazz. So when we're talking about the language, we are talking about using motifs that are traditionally associated with the jazz idiom. When we think of the jazz language this way, it works towards debunking a bunch of myths that we believe as jazz musicians. You know, one of the greatest compliments that you can pay a jazz player is to say, oh, wow, he never repeats himself. He's so good, he never repeats himself. And when I hear people say that, um, what? I've never heard of a jazz great that doesn't repeat himself. Let's take a look at the Omni book. Okay, Charlie Parker's solos. I'm not opposed to using uh, transcription books. They have a purpose. It's just not, you can never use it as an excuse not to do your own transcription. But it's a wonderful way. If it's been done well, it's a wonderful way of analyzing what other people have done. And I think the Omni book is, is, extremely important if you don't have one you should go get one because just for the analysis just the analysis alone now i'm looking at page two of the omni book this is the beginning of charlie parker's solo on confirmation on the first page of his solo page two and these li lines are numbered in this book if you don't have the the um omni book you can listen to this solo online. It's confirmation. Let me see the original recording. Oh, I don't see the, oh, it's Verve 8005. You can listen to it and hear what I'm talking about. This is just the first page of his solo. On line nine, that's the first line of the second page. Line nine, the second measure, he plays this. Okay, that is a jazz motif. Jazz motifs tend to be two beats long, two beats plus one note. So you'll notice that each one of these that I'm playing always ends on that next note of the next downbeat, okay? Now, we're gonna see this motif again, exactly repeated again on line 15. <laughs> Right, and we're gonna see it again on line 17. Exact. It's exactly, no, not even any variation in it. Exactly used four times so far that we're, no, three times, I'm sorry. We see it three times so far. Now, we have a slight variation on line 13. Check this out. Now it's in a different on a different note. 
but it's the same exact motif except that there's a note between the second and third note. If you left that out, it would be exactly the same, but on a different note, okay? Now let's look at this. There is another variation, different note, but same exact lick, but the, the first note has been inverted. If I were to invert that note down an octave, it's the same lick, same motif again. That's just the first page of the first solo in the Omni book. That same exact motif comes up, I'm going to say, at least 100 times in the book. I'm, I'm guessing, but it happens throughout the book. In fact, I'm, gonna, I'm going to just glance ahead. This was not planned. I'm going to glance ahead and just glance at some pages and see if one of the examples of another use of that pops out at me. Um, this is without me studying it in advance. So I'm just glancing. That's making me look like a fool, but I'll find one. Okay, here's one on Now's the Time. That's a slight, um, a slight deviation because the first note is not as low as it would have been. If, if it had been the other, or, yeah, that would have been it. Um, but he played C instead of A. Let's try one more, see if we can find one that sticks out. Here it is on Bluebird. Okay. That same motif comes up, and this is just one. This is like the first, I picked this one because it's the first distinguishable motif that comes up in, his, in the Omni book. It's the very first motif, and the very first motif is present throughout the rest of the book. And it's, just, it's not just Charlie Parker. In fact, that motif, everybody uses it. That's not an unusual motif. It's not in any way odd just to him. How about um, Clifford Brown? This is The Song Is You. And he has an exact, now it, it's two motifs together, but he's using just in the same solo. And I've seen this same motif combination in other solos that he's done. But here it is. That happens in this solo. One, two, three. And I'm counting just the exact ones. One, two, three. I know there's more. I think there's five of them. Five exact repeats. Note per note, exact repeat, repeats. That's not including the ones that are sort of similar. Okay? So we can't say that, that um, a great player never repeats himself. But the difference is, is that we're using the motif in a different context each time. Let's look at this, how, how he approaches that each time. Right? Now look, let's look at the second one. It's different, right? I'm not going to play the third one. Let's go to the fourth one. Okay. You see that? That is proof that what I'm saying is true. He's using it the same way you would use a word in a sentence. He's using a different, so he might be using the word red five times in his story, but it's in a different context each time. That's clear evidence of motivic thinking. Now, I'm not going to say that I'm an expert on on Charlie Parker, an expert on Clifford Brown. I can't say for sure what they were thinking, but I believe that what came out their bell is evidence, at least a hint of evidence towards what they were thinking. And I have also now decades of experience trying to incorporate that into my playing, and so now I can tell you from my perspective what it feels like to play like that.
Another thing that people, you know, the, the, the whole thing about playing changes, this is just as bad as playing the scale that goes with the chord. And it's sort of, they're sort of related, I know that. But there's a lot of people who say that, that the way they think on the, on the gig, they're thinking about the progressions. And I think if you have to think about the progressions, instead of thinking of the language, the audience is missing out. You know, something happens when you play motivically, when the way you create music is from a motivic context, when the thoughts that you're thinking are more motivically originated, you communicate to your audience in a way that the other guys can't. And I, I believe there's a, you know, we're using this, this chart right here. I believe, you know, it's not just a, 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 a metaphor. I'm not saying when I say you speak to the audience, it's not metaphorically. I think there's something to this. I think that the motifs that we play, when we think motiv motivically, it creates words musical words that we put into sentence form. And for some reason, this has more of an impact on the listener than scales. This has more of an impact than, to the listener than playing the changes. Now your teachers might stand there, listen to you, and they're, what they're listening for is if you did what they told you to do. And they not, might nod their head and say, yes, that was a good job, but they're basing that on not how well you sound, but on how well you did what they told you to do. And I don't have a problem with doing what they tell you to do. Until you get out of their class, then you don't play like that. This language thing, when you play motivically, it speaks to the audience, and then not just the audience, it speaks to the other guys in the band. The, the language is so powerful, and it's so moving. You know, people say, you know, the, 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 the new players today, they're so wonderful, but, and this, you know, I have a dear friend who says this. I don't want to say who it is because um, I, I don't know if he would be flattered by this or not. I hope he would be, but I don't want to say any names. Um, he says the, the, the players today are great players, but he says that, Something is missing. He says that the, the, the players, when, when you hear Lee Morgan or, or the guys from back then, it, that it speaks to you, right? How much of it is this? How much of that speaking to you is because they played more motivically and the guys today just play a bunch of scales and patterns and hard stuff? You know? And I, I believe that's what this is. I believe when you play with the language that you're, you're doing something. Now, so now that we've established that, we've established what is a motif, we established how important it is, now the next question is, how do you incorporate that into your playing? I think the first step is to recognize the importance of the motifs. That's the first step and start recognizing it in other people's playing. Start, get yourself an Omni book and look through it. Catalog as many of the motifs as you can and see how often they're repeated. Uh, but the second thing, so I think traditionally we learn the language through what we call two, five, one licks. And I'm kind of, yeah, I, not kind of, I'm opposed to two, five, one licks, but I'm not gonna tell you what I teach that's for my students, and it, it, so um, if you don't have anything else, two, five, one licks are a great place to start. Uh, I prefer not to even call them two, five, one licks. I would rather practice complete phrases. If you practice a two, five, one lick, it's too segmented. Good jazz doesn't follow that, that four bar. Th we have overlapping phrases, okay? So a good jazz uh, line isn't going to start right on the two chord. 
it's going to either start a little bit early or a little bit late. It's going to end in a, a less predictable place. So practicing the two, five, one licks, I don't think is as good as just going through a transcription and practice, practicing the phrases that you like. I think that's the best way to do that. And then the other thing is just make sure that you're transcribing. Now we talked about transcriptions in the first area, the listening. Now we're talking about actually practicing the transcriptions. And yes, you should practice. When, after you've done a transcription, you should practice that transcription. And you should practice it as seriously as you would practice like a concerto or something. Because that's really where you're going to get your language from. That's the key to, to accessing the language. My students, I want them to do transcriptions. We start first with the written transcriptions just because uh, the skill for the other stuff isn't there yet. But ultimately, that's what we want, is we want to have the... And you know what? By the way, when you're doing a transcription, do the stuff you like. Unless it's been assigned to you, don't just arbitrarily pick a, a solo and transcribe it. Transcribe the stuff that resonates with you because it's going to be an influence on your playing. And, and it's important to pick the stuff that you like the most. That way you like what comes out of your horn. So the stuff I teach for language is a little bit more involved than just the 251X and it's actually very labor intense. In fact, uh, some of my students that I was really hoping would do it, because like I said, it's labor intense. It takes time, not just to practice, because, but you're also creating your own materials, which I think is extremely important for a jazz player. Not at the beginning. If you come and study with me right away, don't be intimidated by that. I'm not going to right away make you come up with your own materials. We have stuff, we, we ease you in as you go. But I have had students that when they got to this more difficult part where they have to actually invest time in creating materials, they have been resistant. But the ones who have created their own materials, it's just amazing how well they play. It's amazing, you can listen to it. And even though they don't have the skill yet to sound like great players, in fact, I had a student recently that the, the other people where he was, I'm not going to say who it was, but the other people where he was said, you know what, we can tell that you, you don't have the skills yet, but you sound great. Not, you don't sound, they didn't say you sound like a great player. They said, and, and what I believe is happening there is, is that that student, because he didn't have as much time to practice as what most of my other students do, but because he learned how to play motivically, he was communicating. You know what happens when you choose to live in that world, that, that jazz world where you have to pick the right scale over the right chord? When you live that way, you choose condemnation for yourself hear me out you know there's always been in jazz people with lower skill levels that we still hear how they're playing what they're playing we, we still they still connect to us but when you and that's because of the language i believe that i i really believe that's because of the language but when you choose to to be consumed with that world of scales and technique and all that stuff, technical patterns. That's where you bring now the audience into that. And the problem is that doesn't connect. That doesn't have that same human connection. So the reason you stand condemned is because everything now that you play that is even the slight bit off, that's even just a tiny bit uncomfortable to the audience they feel that they sense that it's it's almost repulsive when you make a mistake and it comes out as a mistake by the way anything that you play now because you're not you're not playing motivically it's sort of like uh, uh just a showmanship of how much skills you can play right 
you actually choose to um, bring that condemnation on yourself, that judgment, because of the way you're playing. In contrast to that, if you're like my student and the skills aren't as high, but you're playing motivically, the audience even has more of a reason to relate because we all have those shortcomings. So when you play motivically, you're now bringing your, not only are you now connecting to the audience, but when you have shortcomings, you're now in a position to relate better with the audience. I think, you know, I, I, I'm not a, I want to keep saying this again. I'm not an expert on the history side and, and, and individual personalities and stuff like that. So I can only tell you what, how, how some of these guys affected me. And, and that's how I see Billie Holiday. What made her sound so good to me was her limitations as a singer. And that brought her to the human heart. So when she's speaking to us through, through, through her music, she's speaking to us from a more humbled position. And we can relate more to that. We, it, it means more to us. And, you know, I can't think of a single reason why anybody, now that you know about these motifs, I can't think of a single reason why you wouldn't pursue this. I can't think of a, a, a reason why you would continue to believe the whole reference to scale to the chord approach. That's not music. I've said this before. That's not music. I don't know what you would call it, but it's not music. And I know people say, oh, how dare you? Um, I've been in this industry, uh, uh, the, and, and I shouldn't call it industry. I'm more on the educational side. Yes, I do make my living in the music itself, in the industry, but as a sideman. And the majority of my efforts here at home have been more educationally oriented. So I'm speaking to you not as an authority in the sense that, um, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert on all things historical. But what I am an expert on is how do you become a better jazz player? I, I can actually, I can confidently call myself an expert as a jazz teacher, someone who's going to help you learn how to play jazz. I'm, and, and I feel so confident about that. I wouldn't even mind people put stuff in the comments, hate mail in the con comments, and I don't care. I've been around long enough to know what I'm doing. So, and, and that's why I'm making such a big deal out of this language stuff, because that's, you know, I'm, I'm a judge sometimes. I, I judge contests, jazz contests. Um, and that's the biggest thing that's missing today. That and the swing. Uh, swing is a big problem today. Everyone's playing ricky tick da 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 well, at least the people I've heard. It's very rare now to hear a, a, a school group that can actually swing. But the other thing is in their improv, even the ones that can swing, there's very little use of language, and what are they doing? The majority of them so, sound like they're playing scales. And the ones who are better, quote unquote, are the ones that play complicated patterns. But none of it connects, none, none of it speaks to the audience. And that's why I'm making such a big deal. I want you to, to let all this soak in. I hope it is soaking in. I hope you're getting it. I hope, I hope this transforms the way you play jazz. And if you already play this way, let me know down in the comments because I, I want to uh, check out your playing. If you're a student especially, if you're a student and you already know about, you may call it something different. I came up with my own language because I have never found anybody that talks about this stuff 
So I kind of made up my own language talking about all this stuff, okay? But if you think this is how you already play, I would love to um, have a link to some of your stuff. I want to hear what you're doing. Otherwise, think about what I'm doing and uh, well, think about what I'm saying and, and try to work some of this out for yourself. Now, I am open, uh, this is not, this series is not a plug for lessons with me, but I am open for lessons, and the reason I'm bringing that up now is the way I teach the language. If that's something you're interested in, we can have some le lessons on that. The only reason I'm not talking about it here is it's too complicated to talk about in a video. I'm not just being stingy. At this point, I wouldn't even know how to do that in a video all right so i'm not being stingy with information i'm just telling you that it's not something that could be easily explained maybe 10 years later when i've been teaching it longer i've only been teaching this for about five years now i've been teaching stuff like it for a long long time but this new thing that i teach is extremely powerful so anyway i hope you enjoyed this video God bless you. Please, if you have questions, leave them below. And if you want more of this kind of video, click subscribe. There will be more videos on improv after this series is done. I just wanted to start with this five areas series because it gives you a foundation to what I teach. I'm not just the um, chords people. You know, I'm not just an... I'm not just a chord person, I'm not just a scale person, I'm not just a transcription person. I've taken all of those schools, wrapped them together into one main package. Now, this language thing just happens to be the most important. That's why this video is so long. All right? Well, thank you, and I will see you on the next video. God bless you.